Bibles to the book of Mark. The book of Mark. Mark chapter 3. Mark chapter 3. Mark chapter 3. When I sit down to prepare this message, I had three points. Well, I started preparing it. I got on the first point, and I couldn't leave it. God wouldn't let me leave it. So I got a one-point message tonight. <laughs> but don't think that it's going to be short because it's a one-point message. Mark chapter 3, beginning with verse 1, the Bible says, And he, that is Jesus, entered again into a synagogue. And there was a man there which had a withered hand. And they watched him, whether he would heal him on the Sabbath day, that they might accuse him. And he said unto the man which had the withered hand, Stand forth. And he said unto them, Is it lawful to do good on the Sabbath days, or to do evil, to save life, or to kill? But they held their peace. And when he had looked round about on them with anger, being grieved for the hardness of their hearts, he saith unto the man, Stretch forth thy hand. And he stretched it out, and his hand was restored whole as the other. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you and praise you for thy goodness. Lord, you have been so good to me. You've been good to our church. God, we praise you for it. We give you all the glory. Father, we come tonight. I come tonight with my cup uplifted. And I ask you, Lord, to help me. I ask you, Lord, to fill my cup to overflowing. And not only mine, but, Lord, all the folks who are here, I pray, Father, you'll bless them. I pray, Father, you'll use this to make us more of what you should, or what we should be for you. I ask you, Lord, just to take control. Lord, I ask you humbly. I ask you in Jesus' name. And for his name's sake, we do pray. Amen. Amen. You know, when we think about Jesus in the Gospels, what do we think about? And I mean by that, what kind of person was this God-man that we call Jesus. Well, you know, the first thing that comes to my mind was humble. He was so humble, so humble that he would open his arms for the smallest child and take him in. Children that grown-ups ignored, he would open his arms for. He was loving, so loving. So loving was he that he would give his life for the vilest, wicked sinner that ever lived. That's how loving he was. For God so, excuse me, uh, for God commended his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. He was forgiving. As he hung on that cross, beloved, suffering and dying, he looked down on people, people full of hate for him people that were mocking him and laughing at him, people who had nailed the, the, the spikes into his hands and his feet. And what did he say? Father, forgive them. Forgive them. For they know not what they do. Oh, he was so forgiving. He was compassionate. Compassionate toward the sick toward the hurting, toward the, the poor, toward those, beloved, that, that, that others, uh, uh, others despise, like that woman taken in adultery, like the lepers, beloved, that no one would even touch or, or go around, like the blind that were ignored, compassionate, even to those who were possessed by demons. He was compassionate. What more can we say about this man, Jesus? Merciful, oh, he was that. Kind, 
He was the kindest. Self-sacrificing. Always self-sacrificing. All of this and more, beloved, was Jesus. Was Jesus. And that's why, beloved, when you read verse 5 in our text, beloved, something stands out like a black cat in a snowstorm. Because it says in this verse, beloved, that he looked round about on them with what? Anger. Jesus, the loving one. Jesus, the compassionate one. Jesus, the forgiving one, beloved, looked on them with anger. He got angry. He got angry. Now, I know that Ecclesiastes 3 tells us to everything there is a season. And in Ecclesiastes 3.8, it says there's a time to love and a time to kill, a time of war and a time of peace. And that is, beloved, and, and, and there is a time when the Lord will make war, when he will, we will move in anger, beloved, and, and tread the winepress of, of God's wrath on this earth. But, beloved, that will be at the second coming. And we're talking about his first coming. His first coming. We're talking about when he came meek and lowly. When he, beloved, came loving and kind, when he came as the Lamb of God, not the Lion of Judah. Folks, whatever it was that made the loving Jesus angry at this time must have been something that was very, very, very offensive to God, to, to him. It must have been something very egregious to him. Something, beloved, that pierced his very soul to make him angry. You know, I asked the Holy Spirit, what, what, what would so affect the loving Lamb of God that he would get angry before his time of anger? And the Spirit, beloved, brought these things to my attention. And I want to bring them to yours tonight. So listen with me. Beloved, at least we make Jesus angry before the time. Before the time. Folks, as I looked at these scriptures, scriptures, beloved, that tell us that Jesus got angry. What caused him to be angry? Hard-heartedness. Hard-heartedness among God's people. Folks, Jesus got angry over the hard-heartedness of his people, of God's people. Look at verse 5. Look at what it says again. And when he had looked round about on them with anger, being grieved for the hardness of their hearts. Folks, listen. Because he was grieved with the hardness of his heart, that's why Jesus got angry with those in the synagogue. Folks, these were people who had come to the synagogue, uh, who had come to worship uh, the true, the one true living God. These were people who came to hear God's word read and, 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 and taught. And of course, Jesus went there too. But while he was there, he was approached by a man with a withered hand. Beloved, folks, Jesus saw that man, but he saw more than just that man's withered hand. You see, he saw, beloved, the pain and the misery that that man was going through with that crippled hand. He saw, beloved, the, the struggles, the struggle uh, that he, he suffered to work or to, 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 to provide for his family or to hold his children or to put on his clothes or to even eat. He saw the struggles this man was going through. And oh, beloved, the compassion of Jesus just felt for him, felt for him. But he saw more than that. He saw, beloved, all the, the, the eyes of that synagogue watching him, watching him. Not, beloved, to, to witness a miracle, but to see if he would heal on the seventh day. 
You see, the Pharisees were there too, beloved, and they were looking for anything, anything that they could accuse him of. Oh, beloved, the, 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 the hard-heartedness was there. Their hearts were so hard. No compassion for the man. No concern for the man. No, no pity for the man. No mercy for the man. On a fellow, on a fellow child of Abraham, they had no pity. No sorrow. Only, only, let's just see if he'll break our traditions. Let's just see if he'll heal on the Sabbath day. Jesus called that man forth. He said, stand forth. And the man stepped, beloved, I believe, right there in front of Jesus. But Jesus didn't look at him. Jesus looked, beloved, at that crowd. And he asked this question. He said, is it lawful to do good on the seventh day or to do evil? Is it lawful to save life or to kill? Folks, what Jesus was saying was this. I can do good by helping this man. I can, I can do or I can leave him as he is and do evil. He, he was saying I can save his life or I can leave his life destroyed. That's what that word kill means. It means, beloved, figurative of destruction. Leave him kill, leave him destroyed. He said, should I, should I do good and save a life on the seventh day, or should I let his life be destroyed because of your traditions of the Sabbath? And folks, their hearts were so hard, so hard that no one, no one, no one spoke a word when he, spoke, when he asked a question. And Jesus, the humble one, looked on them, beloved, with anger, with anger. You see, beloved, they didn't care about the man's suffering. They didn't care, beloved, whether he lived or whether he died. All they cared about was getting something on Jesus. All they cared about, beloved, was, was their stupid traditions. All they really cared about was themselves, themselves. Because you see, beloved, Jesus was a threat to their power. He was a threat to their authority over the people. You can be sure. You can be sure, beloved, that if it had been their hand withered, they would have sought healing from him. Seventh day or not, they would have sought healing. Folks, their, that hard-heartedness toward others, that selfishness for themselves, angered the Lord beyond words. He looked at them with anger. Let me ask you, do you think, beloved, Jesus gets angry when people, Christians, come to worship him as they did? Come, beloved, to hear his word as they did. And then, beloved, refuse to, to have love and compassion on those in need. Do you think he might get angry about that? I believe he does. I believe he does. You know, there are churches, beloved, out there that have 500,000, a million, and even more in the bank, but they won't spend one red cent to help someone meet a need. Meet a need. Y'all can say amen once in a while. Let me know you're still breathing. There, beloved, there are, are some, some, and listen, in those churches, if somebody would dare to stand up and make a motion, to spend some money to help someone in need, beloved, they would have a fit. Hey, we might need that money ourselves. Ourselves. Need it for what? Need it for what? 
Let me tell you something, beloved. Money, when money is given to the church, it is given for the Lord's work. For the Lord's work. Beloved, listen, was it God's work when Jesus helped that man? You better believe it was. You better believe it. Folks, God's work, listen to me, is more than building a nice building. God's work is more, beloved, than having a nice playground for our, chi- a playground for our children. Now, I'm not against those things. I'm for those things. Thank God, and I, I hope that we, we can improve ours. I really do. But beloved, those things are for us. They're for our children. They're for us to come and worship, amen, in this building. It's for us. God's work, beloved, listen, it, in the truest sense, God's work is helping others who are in need. Who are in it? What's the second commandment? The first is love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and mind and soul. Beloved, the second is likened to it. Love thy neighbor as thyself. The second greatest commandment. Second greatest commandment. If we got a church member in need, we should help them. We should help them. If we see a need in the community and we are able, beloved, we should help them. We should help them. We are to help those in need. Those in need. Somebody says, preacher, who are the needy? Glad you asked. Those who are sick. Beloved, if they need help, we help them. We help them. The needy, beloved, are, are, are the, the, the old and, and the uh, uh, infirmed and the widows. If they need help, we should help them. We should help them. The needy, beloved, are the lonely, are the hurting, are the comfortless, are, are the forsaken, beloved. And, 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 and get this, get this, beloved. It's more than financial help that we ought to offer. More than financial help. Beloved, the the needy. See, it's any kind of help that we can give. Any kind of help. Get this. The the lost are needy too. They are needy too. I mean, beloved, who is more in need than the lost? Hey, beloved, they are perishing. They are perishing. They, beloved, are suffering because of sin. They are hurting mentally, physically, emotionally, spiritually. They are crying and they know not why. But we know why, don't we? We know why. And beloved, in all this world, we Christians are the only ones that can help them because we're the ones that can introduce them to Christ. See, our help is not always financial help. It can be comfort to the comfortless. It can be, beloved, taking time to talk with, with some old per- person that's about to lonely away. It, it can be, beloved, sharing the gospel with a lost soul. It can be sharing love to those who are not loved. Oh, listen, you know, Jesus tells us, beloved, if we give a cup of water in his name, we will in no wise lose our reward. Lose our reward. Oh, listen to me. It can be sharing the gospel with a lost soul. Oh, the needs are out there and they are everywhere, everywhere. And yet so many churches and so many Christians, beloved, selfishly will not help those in need. Now you tell me, tell me, tell me the Lord isn't angry at such hard-heartedness among his people. You tell me. Boy, I can see his eyes flashing with anger 
as he looks at churches, beloved, sitting on their money, money that he gave them to do the work of God. I can see, beloved, his eyes flashing with anger as he, as he looks, beloved, at Christians sitting on their testimonies instead of sharing them with lost souls out there. And they're dying and going to hell. I can see his eyes flashing with anger. Beloved, as, as the sick and the, the, the lonely and the aged and the hurting, beloved, weep and cry because, beloved, we're too busy. We're too busy, beloved, to give them a moment of our time. We're too busy going to the ball games. We're too busy, you know, going to the social meetings. We're too busy, beloved, enjoying ourselves. And they're hurting and dying and crying and weeping and suffering. And he gets angry. Folks, how can we look at souls, souls that we know are lost? Beloved, and we understand what that means, amen? We understand what it means. It means eternal torment in hell. We know what it means. How can we look at them and not attempt to help them? How can we look at the sick or the aged or those beloved, those who are, are hurting and not make an attempt to help them, to help them? There's only one explanation, hard-heartedness. Hard heartedness. Hearts, beloved, that are more wrapped up in self than it is than they are in the things of God and meeting the needs that God, that people have as God has left us here to do. And it makes Jesus so angry. Somebody says, Preacher, preacher, don't you know we can't help everyone? No one said you could. No one said you could, but I'm going to tell you what we can do. We can do what we can. We can do what we can. You know, when that woman took that alabaster box of ointment, very precious, very expensive, and break it and anointed the Lord with it. Beloved, there were those there who wanted to find fault. And like Judas, but Jesus said, beloved, let her alone. She hath done what she could. You know, that's all, folks, that's all the Lord expects from us, to do what we can. What we can. But here's the question. Are we doing what we can? Are we doing what we can? Folks, this is a collective question. In other words, this is a question for our church and for every church. But it's also an individual question, a question for each one of us. Am I doing what I can to help meet those needs that are out there? Is our church doing what it can to help those in need? Am I doing what I can to help those in need. And I want you to remember, beloved, the Lord is looking on. Amen? Come on. He's looking on. Beloved, listen. How these two questions are answered will determine whether he is pleased with us or whether he is angry with us. So you see, these are important questions because you see, he's the one that's going to judge us in that day. And we want him to be pleased with us. And let me warn you, let me warn you. Beloved, these can be tricky questions. Tricky questions. Sit, preacher, what are you talking about? They can be tricky, beloved, because listen, you may be doing what you can do in one area but not in another, but not in another. Let me show you what I mean. A person or a church may really be helping the sick, 
but neglecting the withers. Neglecting the withers. A church or a Christian may be beloved helping the withers, but, 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 but neglecting the aged, the seniors. Beloved, they may be all out for soul winning. And I've seen some churches all out for soul winning. But beloved, neglecting to help those who need comforting in the church. Who need comforting. Folks, we are supposed to help all the needy ones we can. All of them. Isn't that what Jesus did? I mean, beloved, as he he raised the widow named son, she she had lost her son, she had lost her support. Jesus raised him from the dead so he could support her, the widow, the widow. But then, beloved, he healed the sick and ministered to them. And then he, he spent time with the children, beloved, so often ignored and neglected. He, listen, he gladdened the heart of old Anna and Simeon. He fed, beloved, the, the hungry with, with uh, five loaves and two fish. He, he, beloved, comforted the heart of a sinner that everyone, beloved, wanted to kill. And I could go on and on and on. What I'm trying to make you see is that beloved, he helped everyone he could. He didn't say, well, I've got to heal this leper, but that's enough. That's enough. He didn't say, well, well, I, I, I'm gonna help this one over here who's possessed with the devil, but that's enough. No. Beloved, he helped with all kinds of needs. Wherever the need was, Jesus was helping. He was helping. You can say, well, I'm going to visit the elderly. Good. That's a good thing. But what about the sick? What about the sick? Well, I'm going to contribute to this love offering for for this one who's sick. That's enough. I've done my part. What about the lost? What about the lost? Folks, if we as a church and as individuals, if we zero in on one type of need and neglect all the other types of needs, all we are doing is buying ourselves a quarter's worth of conscience. That's all. That's all. Folks, we are to do the work of God. God's work, beloved, includes all the needs that we can meet. All the needs. Suppose, suppose I hired Skylar to build me a house. Skylar, I want to hire you to build me a house. I want a turnkey job. Will you take the job? Don't you mess up my, my illustration. Yes, sir. Okay. All right. I've hired him to build me a house. Turnkey job. Scholar goes out there and he says, okay, I'm hired to build a house. That's the work I'm supposed to do. Now, he goes out there, beloved, and he says, well, I think I'll concentrate on the framing. So he starts framing that house. And he frames and frames and frames. And after a while, he's got that house framed. He says, okay, I built the house. I've done enough. I've done enough. You think think I'm going to be happy? You think I'm going to be angry? You better believe I'm going to be angry. I'm going to say, scholar, what about the foundation? What about the the walls, the siding? What about the the roof? What about the plumbing and the electrical? You ain't done the work. You ain't done the work. Beloved, God sent us out to do a work for him. And that is, beloved, to look after or to help the needy. And beloved, if you're going to take one thing and say, hey, that's enough, you're not making him happy. You are making him angry. Angry. I ain't getting many amens on this tonight. But y'all know I'm telling the truth. If you know I'm telling the truth, raise your hand. It's Bible. Raise your hand, Pam. All right, okay. 
All right. Listen. Let me tell you. The work of God is not one part. Beloved, the work of God is a lot of parts. A lot of parts. And as a church and as individuals, we are to address them all. To do what we can do. What we can do. I wish we could help everybody. We can't. But we can do what we can do. When Jesus sent out his disciples, y'all remember that? He sent out his disciples two by two. Sent them out to witness. Sent them out, beloved, to heal. Sent them out to cast out devils. You remember that? Y'all remember that? Beloved, listen, suppose they had gone out and, 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 and concentrated on, heal, on healing the sick. That was it, healing the sick. Suppose they were, they were out ministering to the sick and somebody came along and said, help me, I've got, my daughter's got a devil. Will you cast the devil out? And they said, no, no, no. We're, we're, we're healing the sick. That's all we're doing. That's all we're doing. You think the Lord would be angry about that? Oh, yes, he would. And I believe the Lord is angry at so many churches and so many Christians because in their hard-heartedness, beloved, they, they, uh, are, are, are doing, they are not doing what they can for those with different needs, with different needs. We are to do the work of God, folks, all the work of God. All the work of God. And just, and just, not just one area of his work. Now I want you to get the picture. There was Jesus faced with a need. A withered hand. And there, beloved, were the followers of Jehovah God. Gathered to worship. Gathered to hear God's word. People, beloved, who called themselves God's people. And he looked at them. And he said, should a person do good on the Sabbath day or evil? Is it lawful to, to save on the Sabbath day or kill? And they answered him, not a word. Not a word. Folks, Jesus, he didn't have to heal that man. He didn't come here, beloved, to be a doctor. Now, he is the great physician, amen? Amen. But he did not come to this earth to be a doctor. Beloved, he could, have, he could have said, that's not what my mission is. Not my mission to, to heal the sick. I, I, my mission is to go to the cross and die for my sin. But he knew the, what he was doing. He was supposed to do the work of God. And that was the work of God. He didn't have to. He didn't have to do it. But he knew, beloved, that if he healed, on, and he knew if he healed on the seventh that they were going to accuse him. But there was a need standing before him, a need that he could meet, beloved. It, it would have been evil for him not to have met that need. It would have been evil. So Jesus did good, and he healed that need. He met that need. Those who didn't have compassion didn't want him to meet the need. They were evil. They were evil. And their hard-heartedness, beloved, made him so angry. And let me tell you, it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of an angry God. So let me ask you, is the Lord angry with me? Is he angry with you? Is he angry with our church? Is he? Are we, beloved, are, as we face, are we are faced with needs, beloved, yet in our hard-heartedness, are we turning away from those needs? Or are you meeting the needs that you see? 
Are we meeting the needs that we see? Doing what we can. What we can. I'm going to say a few words here. I am so proud of this church because you are giving people. I thought about all the times I have gone before you with needs needs of folks out there, people in our church, and never once have you turned me down, never once have you done it. We are a giving church. Brother, Brother Don came home from the hospital Friday. He needed a wheelchair ramp. Several of our men, HF and, and Bud Webb and Joe and, and Stephen, beloved, they went over there and they, beloved, Friday and built that ramp. And I'm going to tell you, it's pretty. It's pretty. And by the way, the church paid for it. Paid for the lumber. Paid for the lumber. They will in no wise lose their reward. In no wise. Our ladies, our ladies met this past week and they gave a gift to someone in our church that had a need. I want you to know they will in no wise lose their reward. In no wise. I'm proud of you folks. I'm proud of you folks for that. But what about our aged? Have you called them? Have you gone by and visited them? Have you gone by, beloved, or, 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 or sent them a card saying, I love you, I was thinking about you? You don't know what that would do for them. You don't have any idea. Boy, you go see them, they would be all over themselves. I mean, they would be so glad to see you. It would make their week if you would go and spend five or ten minutes and maybe have prayer with them. What about it? What about it? There's a need. There's a need, folks. There's a need. What about what about the lost? What about the lost? Have you, beloved, shared your testimony with these folks around you that are lost? What do you mean for you? I mean, tell them what Christ has done for you. Have you done that? They're hurting. They're dying. They're suffering. Have you done that? Have you given them one of those CDs back there? That's what they're for. Maybe if you give them that CD, if they play it, maybe God will get a hold of their heart or maybe they might even come to church. Have you talked to them about Jesus? Just loved them. Just loved them. There's a need. There's a need. You know, I got so discouraged before church started. Kim took the list of our members and we were going through it talking about those we need to put on an active list. There were so many. Now, I don't know what the problem is. If it's me, please, please tell me. Because I would never, ever, ever hurt this church. If, you know, I think I'm preaching pretty good. Maybe I'm not. Maybe that's the problem. We haven't had, we, we're not having visitors anymore. When we were having visitors, we were seeing God move in a mighty way. We're not having visitors anymore. One here, one there. Every now and then. Why? Why? They're lost. They are lost. There's a need. Have we done those things? Or, or, or are we hard-hearted, beloved, toward uh, the lost, not caring whether they live or whether they die, whether they suffer or whether they have life everlasting? As the Lord looks at you, a 
As the Lord looks at me, I'm preaching to myself. As the Lord looks at our church, is he pleased? Or is he angry at our hard-heartedness in these areas? Psalm 2 says this. It says, kiss the son, lest he be angry. I don't know about you, but as I feel the Lord's gaze on me, I've got some kissing to do. I've got some kissing to do. I want you to stand with your heads bowed and eyes closed.